I mean, I think that there are a lot of themes in the book that are very accessible. And my biggest hope for readers is that they feel seen. Um, that's something that I that I always hope with all of my work is that you feel seen as a reader, whether it's through your own journey of grief or your own journey of fear or self-discovery or taking back your power. Um, like it's kind of like I'm standing next to you, cheering you on and showing you that it can happen, even if it's through the lens of gods and monsters. Um, and there's a lot of me in these characters and a lot of me in these stories as far as, you know, my own experience with grief and my own experience with fear. And, you know, we're going to get to the other side. So let's dive in. <laughs> Everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. Yet another amazing author on the podcast, which I love. New book is out in the world, um, which is great. I love when uh, uh, a new book ends up in people's hands and people are starting to read and share it, which is great. Uh, Jillian's on the podcast and her book is out. And we're going to talk about everything to do with that. Lots of great stuff. Jillian, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. All right. Tell everybody where you are in this big world of ours. Let's start there. I am in Austin, Texas. Ooh, there you go. It is still like 88 degrees here in October. So we're struggling. <laughs> oh, man. I have my fireplace going th this morning. It's kind of cool I'm jealous. here. Yeah. Yeah. I got a sweater. I'm jealous. Sweater weather, we call it, right? <laughs> there you yeah. Go. Not here. <laughs> Good. Awesome. So your book has just recently come out. Um, you've been doing some signings. You've been busy out there promoting. Tell everybody the name of yeah. your book. What is it? What is this? Yeah, my book is Ruin. It's book one in the Infernus duology. Um, it's a fantasy romance novel um, with enemies to lovers, forced proximity, um, all that good stuff. Interesting. So. All right. So. Yeah. When did your author journey begin? Like, give us a little background. Yeah, so um, I wrote, like, really bad poetry when I was a teenager, like I think a lot of people do. Hmm. Um, and when I was growing up, actually, like, when I was really young, I, like, was very interested in writing and creative writing and everything like that and kind of lost that passion for it, like, as I grew up. And during the pandemic, I said to my husband back in like 2021, I was like, oh, like I have this idea for a book. I really, but I didn't say it like that. I said, I really wish I could read a book like X, Y, and Z. And I kept talking about it and trying to figure out how to get somebody to write. And it's not the book that's coming out right now, but like to write this book. And um, my husband finally was like, well, why don't you write it? And I was like, oh, oh. Uh, I don't know about that. And then we just kind of went back and forth about it over the coming like months. And then eventually got to the point where I was like, well, you know, like maybe I'll take some master classes and see what happens, what comes of that. And so I took some storytelling master classes um, with a few like authors on the website master class. Um, and the biggest piece of advice, the thing that really unlocked everything for me was that one author just said, write what you know, write out everything that you know about the story. And I said, okay, I don't remember anything else from the master classes other than that. <laughs> um, but I said, okay, like, I'll just write out what I know in bullet point form. Like this happens, this happens, this happens. And I ran, I figured out by the end that I had a, I had a full book. And so that kind of gave me the permission to be like, okay, well, like, let's explore this and let's see what happens. So I wrote three books in this urban fantasy vampire series that I then tried to sell and found out very quick. It was not very good. Mm. Um, it was definitely like my first attempt at writing. Um, a lot of it was like summaries of things that happened without like actually expounding upon it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it really gave me the permission to start writing and exploring who I was as a writer. And then at the same time I was reading fan fiction. And when I was on submission, when I was querying, not on submission, but when I was querying my, um, my, my book that I was trying to sell this terrible vampire book. Um, I got the idea for a fan fiction and wrote, 
wrote this fan fiction and was very lucky that people liked it and, you know, get a following online for writing in the Dramione and Raylo fan fiction spheres. Mm. Um, and that's kind of how it all began. And then everything kind of snowballed from there. So do you think this book, you think Ruin would be out if you had not written the first time and kind of no. gone through that process? No, I don't think so. Really? Um, I think I really think everything kind of happened in the way that it was supposed to. And I would not have, you know, if I hadn't written that first book, I wouldn't have written fan fiction mm. and fan fiction and the community that I was so lucky to become a part of and then cultivate was really what gave me the confidence to then keep writing and then also the confidence to eventually like self-publish. Like I would have never self-published Ruin if I didn't have such a wonderful, supportive community backing me and cheering me on. So yeah, definitely it all plays in together. Interesting. How different are you as an author writing Ruin compared to what you were as an author back then? How how different are you? Oh, just completely different. Okay. I um I mean I wish I could tell you in like very tangible ways other than just like skill. Um but I would say my process is much more streamlined. Um I have learned so much from my editing teams. Um I'm I'm very lucky that I've had editors that have been willing to teach mm. and willing to explain the why behind the notes that they're giving. Um, my line editor for Ruin, Lydia Shama, was integral to the book being what it was and also to my growth as an author of understanding how to very clearly and concisely create a world and how to immerse people very quickly in the world and how to create. I already knew how to create, um, you know, interconnected characters and characters that you cared about but she t really taught me how to do that faster hmm. without a lot of like backstory and things like that so yeah okay so for that new author listening who is trying to find their way as an author what kind of words of advice do you have because you have like two different stories here that you've worked through two different books you've worked through what kind of encouragement would you have for them so many. Come on. I my honestly, my biggest advice is just keep writing and yeah. write lots of different things. I have traditional. So for original works, I have a backlog of four manuscripts just waiting to go. Wow. So and then within fan fiction, I've written over 11 different stories. And what I tell a lot of people, especially people that are like, I'm really struggling to find my voice. I don't know. Like, what my voice is as an author. Um, my biggest advice is like, just write, write a bunch of different stuff. Like, especially like short stories. Like I think that that was the thing that fan fiction really helped me with is that I was able to write these shorter stories that allowed me to play around with different characters, different time periods, different settings, also different POVs, first person POV versus third person and, and play around with like really weird <laughs> weird thought processes and settings. And I have like, I have like a Dracula alternate universe story where I really play around with, wow. you know, 17th, 18th century stuff, 19th century stuff. And I have a 17th century, you know, vampire story and things like that. So it's just really, um, it just keep writing, write a lot of weird stuff. Just get it out. And right. Just, just get it out. Just mm -hmm. keep writing. And as you write, you will find your voice and having, I think it's also really important to have like, to find a core team of people that you trust and that you trust to tell you the truth um, about your writing. So I'm very lucky that I have multiple people in my life that, that are not afraid to be like, this isn't good enough. Mm. And in fact, for Ruin, at the ninth hour, I'm talking like, I had to send my manuscript to my sensitivity reader in like three weeks, less than that. And I sent it to my best friend, Angie, and she's like an incredible critical reader. She's a very big book reviewer in the book space. 
And I said, I just need you to read this and I need you to tell me because I was getting a lot of rejection. I was getting a lot of like wishy-washy feedback. And I just said, I need you to tell me what's going on. And she wasn't afraid to come back to me and go, these things need to be fixed. This isn't strong enough. This doesn't make sense. This needs to do this and that. The why behind this is weak. And within, I think I rewrote like 40% of the book. Wow. Before (laughs) before it went to like one final beta reader where I was just like, okay, I'm just going to send this to somebody and see how it lands. And that one final beta reader was like, this is one of the best like romanticy books I've read in a while, like mythology inspired books. Like this is, this is so good. And that was not the reaction I was getting previously. Hmm. So it, it pays to have people around you that you trust and that you trust to tell you the truth. Yeah. Even when it hurts. Ooh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I can I just be done with this already? Come on. I know. Right? And more like, feedback. Le- legitimately, like after we get done here, my next meeting is me meeting with my best friend Angie to discuss book two and go. to begin rewrites on book two. So I'm like preparing myself emotionally. <laughs> to <laughs> just be like, Well, we'll ease into that conversation by doing mm-hmm. this. I like that. Um, in your journey as an author, who has been some of your inspirations, some fellow authors that you look to? Oh, gosh, I don't know if I would consider her a fellow author, but Anne Rice, <laughs> she's on another tier. You're both level. authors, right? You're both no, authors. Yeah. She's a god. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Anne Rice, uh, may she rest in peace, was my, she, I always say she's my longest relationship. Mm. I started reading her when I was 11 years old, wow. which is not the pr- appropriate age to be reading Anne Rice. <laughs> um, we had like an underground like trading situation in my middle school with me and a bunch of friends who would like trade Anne Rice, like vampire chronicle books. Mm. Um, so I would say she's my biggest inspiration as an author. Um, I'm a very atmospheric author. Um, so I take a lot of time to really try to immerse you in a world and to make you feel the world that you're in. Um, like I'm not a very straightforward, like this is happening. This chair is Brown. Let's go. Like it's, it's a very atmospheric sort of feel, which I know isn't for everyone. Um, but I credit a lot of that to, Anne Rice and her very atmospheric, very immersive storytelling where you can, you know, the brocade on Lestat's jacket, Mm. you know? Um, So I definitely credit her with, um, with a lot of my writing and the way that I write. Um, And then another author that I really credit is Katie Robert. Mm. Um, She wrote um, books like Neon Gods, um, and, uh, you know, that whole series. And I really credit her with um, learning how to write spice in a very um, compassionate way, but then also writing in a very diverse way, mm. um, writing with diversity. So she was who I really, I read, um, there's a book, she wrote a book called Wicked Games. And that was the first book that I had read that had a non-binary character in it. Mm. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I want to have my books be as diverse as possible and representative as possible. Um, So I learned a lot from her as to how to write diversely. And within all of my traditional books, there are non-binary characters, characters that are LGBTQ plus. And I learned a ton from her about how to do that in a, you know, in a mindful way. And then of course I have like sensitivity readers and things like that, that live in that community that then give me feedback. So how do you how does an author find a sensitivity reader? I don't even know how do you do that um i have I have an author friend named Amanda Richardson um okay. and she's a incredible off, romance author dark romance author um and I went to her because she writes a lot of okay. intense stuff and I said I need a sensitivity reader do you, who do you use and she really put me on the right track and okay. from there I was able to find somebody so a lot of it's like word of mouth um Especially because you need, like, for Ruin, I needed a sensitivity reader who could read for um, LGBTQ plus and non-binary, but then also, these are all supporting characters, Mm -hmm. Um, but then also touch aversion um, and touch starved. So, um, so Mm -hmm. I was very lucky to find a find a um, sensitivity reader who is who is willing to read for all of those and give me feedback. Um, and then I was able to make small adjustments based upon their feedback, though. 
But I was very relieved when they were like, there's nothing yeah. really offensive in here. Yeah. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of feedback do you get back from a sensitivity reader? Like, what kind of things help kind of shape the story or make you kind of go, I mean, oh, it, I'm gonna, I need to touch that. I need to go back and look at that part. It really depends. I didn't get, for me, I was very grateful that my, I was anticipating feedback like this, the way that you've portrayed this character is offensive and X, Y, and Z, like, or this is insensitive. And I was very grateful that that was not the case. Um, but I did get really good feedback about like, you can't assume someone's gender. So obviously when you're binary, like male, female, you can't assume a gender because you're getting, you know, visual feedback within books. But for non-binary characters, they were like, you need to introduce them in some way. So I have um, a secondary character named Sidero, who is non-binary. And originally, <laughs> Aurelia, the main character, just somehow knows that they're non-binary. And instead, my sensitivity reader was like, you really need to have them introduced. Like, because... Aurelia is not going to know. Yeah. And so I was able to rework the beginning, the first time that Aurelia meets Sidero, where Renwick, the male main character, actually introduces them and uses their pronouns. Hmm. And so then it's a very natural way of just, just like in any conversation, yeah. you know, you that's how you learn people's pronouns. So that yeah. was a big, that was a big learning thing for me that I would not have learned if I had not had a sensitivity reader. It's good. It's good. I haven't had many authors on talking about that, so I'm glad that we're able to talk about it for your book. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So take us behind the story of Ruin. Like, I, I The big thing I want to do on this show is I want to connect readers to you. I want mm -hmm. people to fall in love with your book, fall in love with you as an author. And if this is their first time hearing your voice and the story of Ruin, I really want to kind of paint a picture for them of what they're in, in store, what's going to happen for them as a reader. By picking up yeah. your book. Can you kind of set the stage for us a little bit about Ruin? Like as far as what Ruin's about? Yeah, just whatever you can give us without yeah. giving anything away that's right. really super. Yeah. Important, yes. <laughs> well, so um, Ruin is set in a completely new world that I created. Um, and it starts with you following the female main character, Aurelia, who um, this is a world of gods and monsters. So there's there are humans, but there are like, they're like small settlements of humans. They're not super incidental to the story. Um, it's really about gods. Um, and she's 250 years old. And when she was five years old, she was bitten by this monster creature called a demoni um, that allegedly comes from the kingdom of the dead, which is the kingdom of Infernus. Um, and because of that bite, she finds that as she heals from it, she finds that she has this death magic in her hands. Mm. So within her voice, she has the ability to grow things and to bring life. But in her hands, if she touches anything, it turns to ash. Um, and so there's kind of this dichotomy going on within her. And for the sake of their kingdom, which is called Athera, and the safety of their people, her adopted father, King Typhon, um, essentially like sequesters her away and keeps her away from everybody for the sake of, you know, everyone's safety. Um, and pretty much because of her re repression of these, of this magic, um, it starts coming out uncontrollably in different ways. Um, and we meet her on the night where her magic just loses control and multiple people die. And because of that, she, runs from the kingdom and she runs away and she runs right into the arms of the king of Infernus, which is the rival kingdom who sees what she is, which is a weapon and decides to take her to his kingdom in an effort to protect himself and his people from the king hmm. um, of Athera, which is King Typhon. So it's a story really about, it's a story about a lot of things, but at biggest at its like deepest level, it's a story about kind of what it's like to wake up one day and realize you've given up all of your power and all of your agency and how sometimes to retake that power, we have to become the thing that we fear most. And so for Aurelia, that means really giving into her darker power and becoming the thing that she's been told all of her life that she should be scared of, 
with the one person that she's been told her entire life that she should fear. Um, and yeah, so it's really an exploration of fear and grief and, you know, how you get to the other side of those things and how sometimes the most unexpected people are the people that you find can really help you along the way. Right. But it's dual POV. So it's from both Aurelia's perspective and Ren's perspective. So you get a nice kind of balance between the two. Um, and so there's a lot of death magic and shadow magic between both main characters, which I've gotten the feedback was a nice change that it wasn't just like the male main character who has shadow magic, but also the female main character who has shadow magic. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like, I I'm always curious on how an author builds a world. Like, mm -hmm. like, I'm just, I'm envisioning a blank piece of paper and going, okay, what am I going to write? Like, how am I going to do this? The whole world building thing just seems to be another layer to, to writing that yeah. not only do you have to write the book, but you got to create the world so you can write the book. So mm -hmm. world building, like, how is it done? How do you approach world building? Oh, gosh. Talk, to give us some, some general ideas for, again, the new author yeah. listening, right? So, I mean, it always starts with an idea. Yeah. So I'm very inspired by mythology, especially Egyptian and Greek mythology. So you always kind of have a jumping off point. And then from that jumping off point, it's kind of like a snowball effect where you make one decision and then that decision kind of informs the next one and informs the next one and informs the next one. So for me, I was kicking around this idea. I really love Hades and Persephone retellings. Mm. And then I saw Hades Town the musical. And that was when I really had this like aha moment of like, oh, I, I think I know what I want to write. And it was really when in the show Orpheus um, brings springtime back with his song. And I was like, the power of life in your voice is such a compelling thought. And then it was like, as I kept thinking, it was like, okay, but what if you had the power of life in your voice, but the power of death in your, in your touch? Yeah. And how do those two things, how would those th two things battle? And then it was like, okay, well, what kind of world would this be plausible in? And it was like, okay, well, it's a world of gods and monsters. And then I was just thinking a lot about like different mythologies and different stories. And that's how I came up with the idea that the underworld wasn't under, but actually across a river. Hmm. So to get to Infernus, to get to the kingdom of the dead, um, you have to cross a river and you can't cross the river unless you're either a soul. So someone that's died or you are a, you are someone that has King, King Runwick's favor. So, you know, he's given you this ability to pass through. Mm. Um, and so those specific things, those specific decisions then informed the world. Um, so, yeah, I wish I could like, I feel like it's such a vague thing of like, just make <laughs> some choices and then keep making choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is such like an, it is such like an internal intellectual like thing. And like, as I made, yeah, like once I started making decisions, you just keep making weird, like I would, when I make like monsters and stuff, I like to think about like, what's the weirdest animal I can think of? And then how can I make that animal even weirder hmm. and scarier or yeah. stranger? And then how can I allow, you know, what in their environment would influence this sort of creation? Um okay. There's, so there's a lot of, I ask myself a lot of questions and then I also ask my, my friends a lot of questions and then answer the questions before they, <laughs> there's a lot of like voice notes to my friend Farah where I'm like, what do you think about this? And then I just keep talking and work it out. Um, but yeah, keeping extensive notes is also really important. Yeah. Um, I just wrote a sci-fi romance and I have like a whole, I think it's like four pages long of like a document that's just the planets, their class, what's on the planet, what does the planet look like, what are their what's their culture, different metals, different animals, different drinks, anything you could think of. It's just like the better that you can keep track and the better you can keep track of your characters and what they look like and their relationships with one another the easier it will be to continue to build the world and also the easier it will be to write because you're not having to go through the document and be like, who yeah. is that? Yeah, yeah. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you, I think you mentioned when we chatted before that you've actually created your own language for the yeah book as well yeah okay okay yes. how do you just okay I got it how do you create your own language like I the, again so, I'm, I don't understand how this works this it's is amazing wild it's weird um so I originally had the language of Infernus being Gaelic Good. and that's a choice that a lot of authors make and um I had one beta reader who again surround yourself with people that are not afraid to be honest with you who came to me and said no like you've created your whole world you've created this whole new world with this whole culture and this whole lore that's nothing like that's unlike anything i've ever read before you are settling for just using a language that's already out there and she pretty much was just like make your own language babe <laughs> and so um what i do the way that i create new words and new languages is essentially i will look up the word that I so like say the word is king I'll look up the word king in a bunch of different languages and then I will literally just start messing once I find one that kind of sounds the way I like it to um I will start messing with it messing with the spelling mess, messing with the pronunciation until I essentially have something hmm. totally different okay so like um I can't remember I can't remember the inspiration now for the the um for a lot of the words in of the language of Infernus, but for example, in the book, the word for queen is Lathira. And the word for king is Ardren. Hmm. Okay. And so um you like from the very beginning, you hear people referring to Ren as Min Ardren, which means my king. So, okay. yeah, it's just a lot of staring off into space and, like, repeating words in a really weird way. <laughs> and then <laughs> writing down exactly what it is and then trying to write down the pronunciation and then hoping you remember what the right pronunciation is. Do you get to use these words on your husband at all? <laughs> He's like, wait, no. what words are you saying to me? What are these words? No, yeah. because yeah. I, it's not, I didn't create a language, like, Tolkien created a language of yeah, the elves. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, nothing yeah. like that. It's I, it's nothing that complicated. It's more like um, specific words or phrases, um, like Lathira Nathira, which is I'm actually not going to say what it means because yeah. it's a spoiler. But um, yeah, no, totally, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, like it's different phrases and titles. Okay, essentially. Good. So, yeah, right. it's, uh, it's a lot I've... of staring off into space. It's fascinating. It's fascinating what goes on behind the scenes of a book. We see a book on a shelf. We see a book on a website and go, eh, it doesn't look that hard. It's re it's really complicated. Yeah. All the moving pieces that you have going on to build the world, create the characters, create the storyline, create a language. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, this is amazing. And it really it. is. It is a skill and it is a muscle that, like, the more you use it, the easier it becomes. Um, like creating the language of Infernus was really hard. It was really hard. And I spent a long time agonizing over what it was going to be and what the words were. And then when I went back to write book two, like six months ago, it was like, oh, yeah, I know. I know how to do this. Like, this is great. And then for my sci-fi romance, I have these crazy planet names and crazy languages and things like that and it was because i had done it so much it becomes so much more accessible so it goes back to that same idea of like you just keep doing it just keep writing and keep trying and keep doing weird things and then eventually that weird thing that you just kind of like did once is like well i keep doing it and now suddenly i'm like pretty proficient at creating weird words very cool i like it <laughs> i like it um you talked um about a uh, book launch for your book um, I'm always curious about how authors go out and promote their books again, to support the authors listening that are looking for unique and creative ways to get out there and talk to their community. Tell mm -hmm. me what's working for you so far. Yeah. Um, so I had a very successful advanced reader campaign with the nerd fam. Um, they are just a wonderful resource for, especially for indie authors mm. of connecting you with readers and reviewers who um, are very excited and passionate about what you're going to offer them. Um, I cannot recommend working with them enough. Um, they really got my book out into like the book talk sphere and the Instagram sphere. Um, and then 
honestly, there's just a lot of like trial and error for me. I, I did majority of my promotion and by majority of my promotion, I mean, I've done all my promotion online. Um, especially because I am exclusive with Amazon currently. So I'm not, my book isn't in Barnes and Noble. It's not accessible really in a bookstore unless I've done like some sort of consignment with them or I'm doing like an event with them. Yeah. Um, and so it's a lot of just like trying different things and seeing what works. So I did like a whole, I made a whole video series of like quotes that were just like different like landscapes with quotes. And I figured out very quickly that that didn't work and that people didn't care about that because nobody had read the book. So it was like, who care? Like, this isn't compelling versus having a quote with a piece of art attached to it. Suddenly people can see who the characters are. I think for me, the biggest, the biggest success was I commissioned a lot of art Hmm. from really wonderful artists giving back to the artist community, especially in a time when AI is so prevalent and destructive. Um, I really made sure to commission some really beautiful, wonderful artists who were able to give me, um, really great depictions of my characters and different depictions of my characters, which then captured a lot of people that hadn't heard of the book or were on the fence and then saw a piece of art and things like that. I think art for me was the most successful thing, Hmm. um, as far as promotion goes. So yeah, it's just a lot of like making weird stuff and yeah. being like, do you like this? <laughs> and yeah. then people being like, no, <laughs> me, me being like, okay, lo, I'll see you again in a couple of days. No, I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me see what else I've got. <laughs> uh, I like your commitment to the artist. That's, that's amazing because I think that they're going to share because they're in your book and they're, they can be like, well, I love the connection that you have with them and that they have with you. I just think that's kind of a nice, back and forth between author and creative. That's, that's, yeah. that's a, a unique cooperation you have going on there. I like that. Yeah, I was very, I mean, I have a, I was very excited that one of my good friends, um, Karina Giada is a beautiful watercolor artist. Um, and she actually did the very first piece, character piece of art of Ren and Aurelia. And I actually have the like original watercolor painting like in my bedroom hanging up Hmm. um so yeah i i really love art i think it's also a really tangible way of connecting you immediately to the world and to the characters because i can tell you ren is a six foot something pale man with dark you know black hair and dark blue eyes and he's broody and aurelia is a five foot something strawberry blonde god with black scars on her wrists and that like doesn't really do anything but then if i go here's what they look like yeah suddenly and suddenly a a reader has an emotional reaction to that and it's much more likely to go and and buy your book or try it on kindle unlimited and i've been very lucky that a lot of people have read the book on kindle unlimited and then immediately purchased the paperback Mm. good which is amazing and i'm very proud of the book and the way that the book looks and my um cover artist, story wrappers, and my interior design and map makers, um, Travis to the moon and back designs, they did an incredible job creating the book. And um, I think that's influenced a lot of people to go like, okay, I read this. I liked it. I need it on my shelf. (laughs) Yeah. And I can't wait for the next one. And the next, next thing that you write, you know, that's amazing too. Yeah. I've had people read the book in like a day and then message me and be like, I'm ready for book two. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, cool. Please give me a minute. Yeah. (laughs) I'm glad that you read this story yeah. that took me months in, in one, day, one day. Yeah, one day. In six hours. <laughs> but uh, I need a little bit more time. Wow. That's great. Um, yeah, for yeah for the readers then, I just, I really want to build up the anticipation for them to get the book. One of the questions I like to ask authors is, I want you to picture the reader holding your book. They just got it and they're going to read for the first time. Before they get in, before they start reading, on top of all the great information you've given us already, what's your love letter to the reader? Like, what do you really want them to know from your perspective as the author before they start reading? Kind of what's your message to them? I mean, I think that there are a lot of themes in the book that are very accessible. And my biggest hope for readers is that they feel seen. 
Um, that's something that I, that I always hope with all of my work is that you feel seen as a reader, whether it's through your own journey of grief or your own journey of fear or self-discovery or taking back your power. Um, like it's kind of like I'm standing next to you, cheering you on and showing you that it can happen, even if it's through the lens of gods and monsters. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of me in these characters and a lot of me in these stories, as far as, you know, my own experience with grief and my own experience with fear. And, you know, we're going to get to the other side. Mm. So let's dive in. That's great. <laughs> Um, Jillian, take us to the website. I have it up here on the screen while we're chatting. It's a beautiful website, by the way. I love it. Thank you so much. So I nice. worked so hard on it. Is that you? <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, me and, me and Squarespace template. Come on, it's the gorgeous. The cheapest template I could possibly find. It's really I'm nice. trying to do the most with the cheapest template possible because <laughs> your girl's on a budget yeah. trying to do book two. Well, we're going <laughs> to sell you lots of books. You can definitely have some money back. It's a beautiful website, though. For Thank those you. coming to your site for the first time, uh, what are we going to find? Um, well, the first thing is you're going to find uh, the ability to sign up for my newsletter. Perfect. And um, my newsletter, I try not to spam people. So you typically will get an email like once every few weeks. Um, but in that email is usually first access to things like tickets for signings. Um, my mailing list had first access to sign up for my advanced reader. Um campaign of getting a book um they get art first um and then i also have a section in every single email for my dog walter and it's called walter's world walter where you walter yes. he's an english cream golden retriever he's a puppy he's a menace mm -hmm. um but in every single email i have like a little section with like a picture of him that i haven't really posted online uh talking about walter and what's going on with him and what he's up to um, but yeah, it's a lot of like first looks at things. Um, they'll find out the name of the book first. They'll find out the release date first. Um, they'll see the cover first, everything like that. So it's a really nice way of like staying connected to what I'm doing and getting first look at things. Um, I'm kicking around the idea of starting a Patreon. And so, um, if that happens, the newsletter will heal, will hear about it first and get first dibs. Um, so yeah, the newsletter is definitely the first thing that you'll see. And then um, right below that, you'll see my signings. I have a signing coming up yeah. on November 9th yep. um, in Florida at Bookish Boutique in Panama City. And then I'm very excited because I have a signing in New York City Come on. in December yeah. um, at, the Rip, at the Ripped Bodice in Brooklyn. And um Hopeless book lover Giselle Gonzalez is going to be there um, doing the event with me, moderating, and ha we'll be having a, a nice chat about the book and about writing and all the stuff in between. Um, and then there will be a signing afterwards. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I don't know when tickets will be on sa sale for that, but they should be coming out within the next month or so. So sure. we can go to the website for more details and all that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sense. Once I have, and once I have, um, the sign up and everything that'll go on my website. And then um, it'll also be like in my newsletter and everything like that and on my social media and everything. So yeah. And then other than that, it's on the website. It's pretty much like a blurb, the cover of ruin. Yeah. Um, I have some, I have some reviews on there. Um, and then every, like every other part of the part of the website is like character art. So you'll be able to see like the characters and things like that. So in behind your slide for your signings, I see artwork. Is those are your characters from the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like every yeah. every other slide, every other section is the artwork. Back, the background is character art. Beautiful. Yeah, I love it. Excellent. It's Thank gorgeous. You. Really, Thank really good. You. What about social media? Thanks. Where are you most active on social media? Uh, I'm most active on Instagram. Okay. Um. And my Instagram handle is Jillian Eliza. Um, that's where I'm most active. I'm not super active on TikTok right now because I made the mistake of doing a TikTok promotion. And fun facts, when you do a TikTok promotion, they then repress your content and re repress your views afterwards. So you keep doing promotions. So I'm kind of just doing the bare minimum on there, trying to get myself out of that hole. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm most active on Instagram. Um but you can find me on TikTok too. It's like similar content on TikTok, but I 
answer messages on TikTok, on Instagram okay. um, all right. and all that. Good. Um, as we wrap up, Jillian, again, thank you so much for doing this. Congratulations on your book. Yeah, thank you. On your journey as an author. And I know you have lots of stuff coming in the future. Um, I like to kind of leverage the name of my podcast as my kind of my last question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Living the Next Chapter. And I know you're writing and you're continuing your journey as an author. But in big terms, little terms, how are you living your next chapter? What's coming up? Oh, gosh. Well, there's a lot of exciting things coming up that I can't talk about yet. Okay. But um, uh, book two is coming. Yep. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to have um, a release date within the next month or so of book two. Um, I'll be releasing the title of book two in November, um, like towards the end of November. Um, and yeah, so book two is coming uh, and some other stuff is coming and we're cracking along. There you go. <laughs> I love it. It's good. It's yeah. great. Well, again, congratulations on the book. Congratulations on your journey so far. Um, uh, I'm just excited for you to see where you're going to be heading. Thank you. And, I'm excited for those that are going to be able to come and see you in person and to get Me their too. book signed and get to talk to yeah. you. Like, that's got to be the coolest thing ever to have somebody stand there in front of you and go, I yeah. love what you do. It's like, I can't believe I get to meet you. This is so cool. It's so funny because writing is such a singular profession where yeah. you're doing it alone. And then I always say, like, it, like, it's just you. And then the circle gets a little bit bigger and it's like you and some friends and then it's you and your team. And then it's like it at a certain point, the book isn't yours anymore. It's mm. like everybody else's. Um, and it's really, it was a really cool experience. My last signing to get to meet people that have followed me from fan fiction into traditional or original works um, and seeing, seeing their excitement and passion for these stories that I wrote in my pajamas. So yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. Um, everyone, all the information for Jillian will be in the show notes. As always, links to her website, social media, everything. If you are and if in you the read area, the book and you like yes. if you read the book and you liked it, please leave, leave a, review a review on Amazon and Goodreads. It helps me so much as an indie author. And a detailed Sorry to interrupt. detailed review. Don't just say like great book, great author. No, like yeah. tell people why you love it. Like make sure people yeah. know, right? Sorry to interrupt. Sure, no. I just I gotta say, please, Very please leave important. a review. And again, if you're in Panama Beach, City Beach in Florida or Brooklyn, New York, uh, you got the dates right here on the website. Make sure you put those in your calendar and be there and go and uh, talk to Jillian in person. Jillian, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really great to have you on. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Hey, thanks for being here for the Living the Next Chapter podcast. So glad to have you as part of our family of listeners. There's a seat for you just here on Living the Next Chapter, and I'm so happy that you have listened to all the way to the end. Wow, you are now my new bestie. I want to let you know that I host seven other podcasts on top of Living the Next Chapter. Yep, eight total. One of them is called the How To Podcast Series. If you are thinking, you know what, Dave, this podcast thing seems like a lot of fun. Well, I'll give you a secret. It is. It's a great amazing fun time where you can get to meet great people get your word out there promote your book promote what your coaching program whatever you're doing podcasting is great and if you want to learn how to do this what you're hearing right now head over to howtopodcast.ca and look up the how to podcast series on youtube whatever app you're listening on you'll find me there and i'd love for you to come listen to how to do this and if you're interested and have questions on how to podcast Reach out to me at howtopodcast.ca. Thank you for listening. Talk soon. <laughs>